Okay, it is 5.30, so I'd like to call this meeting, this special meeting of the Longmont Housing and Human Services Advisory Board to order. Uh, our first order of business is whether there is any public invited to be heard. No, there is not. I did not get any requests from anybody to join the meeting, either in oh. person or by phone. Thank you. Uh, and it does look like we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven board members. So we do have a quorum. Okay, so uh, the reason that we got together tonight is the follow up to our regular meeting where we discussed the potential, making a potential request to of council to redirect 10% of the policing budget towards the housing and human services advisory well, well housing human services budget uh, so we do have two variations of the letter one created by the group the board member group that was put together to look at language given the feedback that was given during the last meeting and then uh, another variation which was put together by staff in consideration of their um, insight into uh, the mechanisms of Longmont city government and how that may or may not influence success. So I thought what would be helpful if uh, unless somebody wants to just jump in and make a motion and we can have all this discussion within that. Uh, at what I thought would be helpful is just to hear from each group, a representative of each group, on the rationale behind the wording in the document and uh, proceed that way. I am open to a motion if somebody wants to start there. We're going to end there anyway. So, um, you know, we can have all this discussion within the motion as well. Uh, it's I'm agnostic on which way it happens, but I'm certain that some discussion will be a benefit to the group. Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, if you want the motion now, I, I can make it. I, I would actually probably be more comfortable hearing from folks before, okay. um, before a motion's made, just to make sure that before we anyone here on this board states an opinion one way or another, that, that everybody involved in the process has a chance to get their yeah. thoughts out. I think that might be helpful. I, I tend to agree with that. If, if that's acceptable to the other board members, and let's go ahead and do that. So uh, our board committee, not committee, our, our working group was comprised of Graham, Madeline, and uh, Deanna. Yep, thank you. Uh, so why doesn't one of you open it up with your, uh, if you can, just, you know, some background on the structure of the letter and, and why it was, you wanted to create it the way that you did. So you're all just not doing anything. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll start. I'll start. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Madeline. Um, the uh, rationale, my rationale behind it was to make it, um, make it a little uh, more, more firm, a little firmer uh, to city council so they wouldn't uh, just read it and push it aside. And so I spent a considerable amount of time writing a letter and I forwarded that letter to I forwarded that letter to, um, just a second. I forwarded that letter to Eliberto. And Eliberto, I'm not sure. I was, I don't know. I, I thought, I thought it would be shared with all of the board members, but I'm pretty sure he edited it. So other, yeah, other than that, that was my, my uh, intent, to make it stronger. Right, so so, to, so for Madeline's sake, yeah, Madeline sent her letter and then the subcommittee <coughs> on it, and then I, I 
made those edits and then I sent it out to the subcommittee one last time for revisions and then Graham revised it and I sent it back out uh, for any further comment or revision. Hearing none, I sent, I gave that to Nicole to send out to the board. So it was based on Madeline's original letter and then Graham's revisions, my edits and Graham's revisions to that, to, to those edits. Thank you, Alberto. Um, Madeline, I just wanted to ask you on this point of, of edits, are you satisfied with the way that the letter turned out relative to your own intentions? Oh yeah, yeah, it's okay. I just would have preferred to have been um, notified of that, but, but it reads well. It's, uh, it's a little lengthy. But maybe my maybe mine was too. I don't know. Okay. All right. Thank you. I have one other question. Uh, Alberto and Karen created one, right? That's they created correct. a letter. Okay. Um, I guess my question is, if we were working on this, if they were going to do it, well, what? Why did they need? Why do you? Why do we? Why? What was our purpose? Yeah, that's a good asking. question. Madeline, so let's, if you don't mind, let's do this. Let's hear from Graham and Diana. Uh, and then I think when we address the second version, uh, Eliberto and Karen will have an opportunity to give a more detailed response to your question. Does that sound Very okay well. to you? Very well. Okay, thank you. Uh, Diana, would you like to weigh in? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time reflecting and thinking about how this letter should be drafted in the most effective way to try and communicate our, our points. And, and I think obviously the main difference between these two positions is the, the advocating 10% reallocation from um, the police budget. And I can see the pros and cons to both of these approaches, but I think the subcommittee in our discussions were, we were interested in um, two things, right? Like making sure that we increase the, the budget if we can for our services and also sort of being a little incendiary to try and get the ball rolling to um, get the community engaged in having this discussion, right? And I think if you take away that concern, then the second letter is probably more effective. I'm sort of, I guess, giving you my thoughts on the second letter and, and I'm not sure that you asked for that, but I'm doing it anyway. Um, but it may be more effective in terms of not alienating counsel, but it certainly isn't going to really push the envelope, I don't think. But So I think we all need to talk about whether that's our, our motive here or not, our motivation. That's really helpful. Thank you. Graham, would you like to comment? Sure. I, I think as a general report about how the meeting went is um, – Deanna and Madeline both submitted revised versions of the letter and then the committee reviewed both of those versions and Eliberto, you know, in real time before us sort of cut and paste and and wove those two letters together and then we added some language and took away some language. Um, so that's how the structure of the meeting went such that um, Eliberto came up with the letter you see here. Um, I think I personally was a little surprised about how the subcommittee went. I, I feel like um, the feedback, some of the feedback I got from the larger group prior to included removing the relationship with the police, included um, detailing how much money and how is it to be distributed, et cetera. And I think the subcommittee group decided that a lot of those issues uh, were in the purview of council and not us. And so seemed like we were settled in on, a, on the letter it needs to be sort of this uh, value proposition. Um, and then we added some interesting points about uh, suggesting they request feedback from, um, you know, BIPOC groups about their interface with the police, et cetera, um, and, a, and a couple other main points. But um, yeah, I think uh, the, the intent is to continue to be, um, yeah, incendiary or provocative or um, uh, to make a statement about number one mainly that nonprofits need funding we did before COVID and now all the more because of COVID a and um, we think it's worth mentioning and relating you know the issue about um, the public safety department and their funds and then we mentioned those three programs which are 
um, you know, Angel Initiative and, and, and those. And we discussed that and we discussed how those are in large parts funded by grants, um, though there is a baseline funding which comes from the department. Um, anyway, we, we wanted to specifically call those out as something we really want to encourage and appreciate about public safety. Um, I think that's all I have to say about it. Okay, um, I've got a couple questions, but I want to, you know, I think let's just try to have a dialogue like we did the last meeting. Um, well, let me, let me think through this. I probably should have done this before we jumped on. Actually, if, if I may, uh, let me ask Ella Berto and Karen to kind of walk through their version, and then let's open it up for discussion and, and uh, make sure everybody's comfortable with, with um, what we know. Jake, you okay? Just pensive? pensive. Just kind of my general attitude, Mr. Chair. Yes, I totally get it. Okay. All right, so uh, Karen Eliberto, do one of you want to open up with a, a kind of viewpoint on your own creation? How about Karen? You want me to go? Yeah. So, so, so Madeline, to your point, um, or your question is, it, it really wasn't our intent, um, and I'll, I'll speak for me. write a letter, um, and, and I expressed my- Sorry, hang on one second, Karen. I, I think you're cutting out a little bit. Is it just me or- Yeah, no, uh, I can't no. hear, I can't okay. hear her. Sorry, you're, you're cutting out. Run to get closer. Better? No, no. No? No. No, no. I have a new computer. <laughs> okay, well, that was better. What you just said was better. Oh, I, so I guess I'll yell though. So, um, so the uh, the intention wasn't for uh, for staff or I didn't need for staff to write a letter. And um, but I was I expressed at the at the end of the last meeting that um, that that ten percent redirect I felt very strongly was a, a non-starter. And um, so. Certainly, I'm involved in the budget process. I know what we are looking at in terms of one budget. Say, Karen, I can't. I can't hear Karen, um, Brian. So don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Let's just go ahead and go ahead with the meeting. It's okay. So, um, so you know, so I really was at ten percent, and um, going back to what. Uh, I think what what um, Brian had identified in terms of that, um, that we wanted to try to highlight, and, and maybe it's, it's back to really what's the purpose? What are the what's the purpose? What I had written down was money for human services is our number one priority, um, and then advocating to address about our whole culture um, and our community. And, and address PD um, and their role, and then to really talk about what is our role as an advisory board in that work, and and to be provocative. So those were the five things that I had written down. Um, so what I so I just felt very strongly, and I wanted to just articulate it that if City Council, if we presented this letter to City Council, City Council said, "Staff, what do you think?" Um, that is what I think is what I, is what Eliberto and I wrote. So um, that so we we when we wrote that um, and so if council asked the question, I wanted the advisory board to know this is how I would answer that question. Um, I think that having more money for human service agencies, we are on a, a path for that. Um, and I think advocate to stay on that path. I am certainly working on other avenues to get funding available. We do want to start investing, I think, more in um, how do we keep people even out of needing to contact the police department, um, you know, for getting their human services. 
how do we make sure that everyone um, has a healthy start in life and has the resources that they aren't getting involved in criminal justice system? So they aren't having to call 911 when they need basic services. I think, you know, we can all, I mean, my sense is that we can all agree with that. And we do need some more money and greater investment. That, um, and I just don't think the saying take 10% from the services budget when I know we are we are going to be poor in terms of our 20 revenues and the $2.1 million put it into the fund. I just think that our message about the importance of funding addressing all those things will get lost and will be dismissed. And I think that if we have a path forward if we advocate for continuing um, to get so we're gonna get $2.1 million dollars you know, no, um, but is there more money that we can try to advocate for? And I think we can get in the 21 budget, even though we are looking at reduced revenue. So I'm just saying we're working it. We're trying to get, uh, you know, money. We're trying to stay on course, for 10%, peeling off for public safety and services. I feel very strongly that that is not the right strategy and our effectiveness. So so then if council asks Eliberto, I'll just say yes, Karen, so what do you think? What I would say is what I is what is in the letter. There are many parts that you you know we tried to capture the essence of some of the things we saw in the in the letter that the put together. Um, it, we even include hey we were gonna we considered the, the ten percent ask, and so we tried to. I tried. Eliberto tried to capture what we thought were um, some of the key points. Out saying, "Give us ten percent." That that was the that was the main issue. So I wanted to know that they asked me a question. What do you think, Karen? That is what I would say. And I, I just thought it was important for you all to know. That. I don't know, Alberto, if you want to add it. Yeah, so thank you. And uh, before Alberto speaks, so we could hear, at least I could, most of what you said. I followed the thread. Um, you may check your audio settings. If it's a new computer, maybe there's something, or it could be your, your, um, your, your earbuds. It's it. Um, just, just throwing it out there, and, and we'll let Alberto fill in. Okay. Brian, I couldn't hear Karen, just for the record. Okay, thank you, Madeline. Eliberto? Yeah, I think I'm gonna, I think to Karen's point, right, when I, I mean, I brought it up at the subcommittee, my concerns about um, the 10% and the, the op, you know, I agree with what we talked about, that we have one opportunity. And I think for me, um, I wanted to, to honor the idea of the provocativeness and the, and the idea of, of, of addressing, um, you know, the, the realities of, of institutional and systemic racism that is everywhere. And Longmont is not immune from that. So I wanted to make sure that that was up front and center, which why when I drafted it, it's in the first or second paragraph. Um, and at the same time, I've been I've been talking to nonprofits. I've been hearing from nonprofits. I've been seeing surveys that nonprofits are filling out of the Funders Collaborative, and just seeing and hearing the reality of the struggles they're facing as far as as far as financially is concerned. Um, I've sat on a couple of committees for both community foundations, Longmont and Boulder Foundation, that when they were giving out uh, when they were awarding some of their COVID response dollars, and so I I, I really really believe that it's highly important that whatever we can, if we can, if it's possible, that we increase the level of funding that we can provide to ensure that, that, that you know, some of our most important safety net nonprofits in the area um, continue to thrive and, and, and serve in a time when they, when they have been needed more than ever before. So that, that's, that would, that's kind of my, my focus is, um, Want to make sure that we we honor the, the what the board is 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 looking for as far as addressing racism, and we want to make sure that we're the most successful as possible 
to increase funding to support these nonprofits. So that 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 was my 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 take when I when I helped draft this letter from the staff. Thank you, Karen. So can I can you hear me now? I took my ear bud out. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Caitlin's saying kind of I, I can hear it, but. There's like static coming in on a, like every other word, um, which is making it hard to understand like the full context. Right. That's right. why I was putting my ear my earbud. I don't. I don't know. Uh, go ahead and give it a shot, Karen. It's important that you're able. Well, I don't have to add anything more to say. I just wanted to check to see oh. if this audio is better. I find it to be better. Better. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and have a discussion. Uh, is there anybody who has, oh, Graham, go ahead. So I'm curious to ask staff if, if the, the, is it that you don't think the right thing to do is to reallocate 10% or you just don't think it's an ask that council will take seriously or absorb and, like, I guess which one of that, which one is it? I would say both, Graham. I, I think it's, I think it's both. Um, so. I answered your question. So I don't really want me to say anything more. That's, but, that's, uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah cause, okay. um, you know, cause we did talk about that there are, um, I, I mean, no, no one is perfect obviously, but but I think the fact that, that you all had quite a bit of discussion at the last meeting about, um, you know, some of the work that the, that the Lama Police Department um, is doing, has been doing to, um, to really try when they do come in contact with people who have behavioral health issues, substance abuse issues, whatever. I think that the department believes pretty darn strongly that those problems should not be solved in the community. So they have put into place the, um, the programs to really try to divert people who are really struggling from the criminal justice system into getting the services that they need. But we heard that, I think, from Madeline, not Madeline Piercey, but uh, when she talked about when, you know, that uh, Linda, you know, had really been talking to Mike Butler about that. So, so, you know, I, I just don't think, and we also talked about not punishing another um, you know, department in this. In this. So, so I, I just believe that it's not the, I don't believe in that strategy. And, and I also think that it's not gonna get us what we need. But I think everything else in the letter, you know, if, it was at 10%. I think you did a great job with the letter. I think it reflected um, our conversation. You know, I, I might not agree with everything, but I don't have to agree with everything, but it really is that, it really is that. Can I say something? Karen, yes, Karen, go ahead. I just, why can't we say like 10% of the budget that we're asking for, if the police can use that 10% to do, to put it toward human services, you know, I mean, why, why would we have to take it away from the police when, if we, if they, you know, allotted 10% of that budget to go toward human services? And that way there, you wouldn't take it away from the police, but they'd have to prove or show that 10% of that budget would go toward helping mental health and situations like that. I don't the know. The only thing I would say to that, Karen, is that when you when you talk about a $2.1 million reduction, you're talking about um, layoffs. So, I mean, you really, it, they are, it, it's a bit. So it's, it's not, not that easy. So we're just saying, and I think, so well, that kind of hit on top of the reduction that we're going to have is basically we're saying, hey, off um, folks that work in public safety have additional money. Caitlin? Thank you. Um, 
I so I can say for me, um, I I fully understand where staff is coming from in terms of advising what they think um, the city will do. I can also say that um, I think our police I think our police budget needs to be reduced. I think the money needs to be out of the hands of people who have who have guns. Um, I think that it needs to very clearly be distinct and separate. And so I think that it's really important to not just say in this time and to what we're reacting to that it is not just about increasing human services. It is also about reducing the possibility of those funds getting reallocated next year within the police department to something that can be used to harm members of our community. I know that, um, I think it's, for me, it's really, um, it's, it's tough because there are, I do think there are good police officers, but the system in which they operate, regardless of where that is, is a system that relies on using violence and guns to ensure compliance with laws. And I really just think that in order to expand our imagination about what it looks like to have public safety, it means that we need to reallocate those funds to other places. Um, I mean, even just looking at the total budget for public safety in Longmont um, and then the police sub budget as compared to like the human services um, that we're putting into the community here, there's a huge difference there. And granted, that's not all the city is spending on um, housing and human services, but there's a huge disconnect there. And I think that it's really important to make a statement that this is not, that this is about responding to that call from communities of black, indigenous, and other people of color that's saying we need to divest from police specifically and invest in community scaffolding. Um, and so I think like for me, I don't, I, I will always say like, let's fund more human services, but it's important to have that pairing of divesting and investing together. Thank you, Caitlin. Other questions, comments? Jake, yes. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I take it we're kind of in the, the general discussion uh, section of this conversation now. So I, I think I would ask folks on the board, and, and I first of all, I want to say I appreciate the position staff is in, and I understand where they're coming from. Um, you know, a letter from an advisory board saying something like this could certainly start a community-wide conversation that isn't necessarily the community-wide conversation that, that staff or council want to have. I, I get that. Um, I get the position that 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 creates for them. But I, I think for and I understand also, you know, kind of the fundamental thing that we have to ask ourselves in this conversation is what are we trying to do here? Are we trying to make a statement about exactly what Caitlin's talking about, the gap between how we fund law enforcement and how we fund human services? Or are we trying to simply make a statement about funding for our, you know, our funding cycle and the plan that, that council's on? Those are, I think, the choices. And whatever, and wherever you come down in that conversation about what the point of this is, is I think we're gonna, you're gonna come down here. For me, the point of it's pretty clear. Um, and I think we, we as a board have an obligation to speak you know, plainly about, you know, since we started the conversation, um, you know, about whether or not law enforcement is really the best and most effective provider of human services in, in our community, uh, about whether we as a community believe that we should be asking law enforcement to remain the number one mental health provider in Boulder County and in our community. Um, or do we want to say, hey, Council recognizing fully that the likelihood of council seriously considering a 10%. I mean, I, I think it's, I want to make this acknowledgement recognizing that they would seriously consider making that budget adjustment. It's pretty small, pretty, pretty thin, um, pretty slim. Um, but we as a board starting that conversation and encouraging that discussion and saying, you know, what are we as a community going to try and do to create um, to create an environment where all of our all of our residents feel safe um, 
and where our law enforcement and our human services sector are doing the roles that they're supposed to do. And asking that question, which we've asked many times in these calls, you know, are the services being provided by law enforcement on the human services side really someone, you know, do you need someone with a gun showing up to a, to, to a, a mental health welfare check? Do you need someone? And I think what we're doing by sending that first letter, which I applaud the, the task force for the work, and I thank staff for their assistance as well, and, and something I'm sure is not the most comfortable thing in the world. What we do by sending that first letter to council is saying, no, we want to have this conversation. We want to have this conversation about human services needs and whether or not we need to reconfigure some of this. So I am uh, fully supportive of the first letter. I, I'll wait to to make a, a motion until there's further discussion, but um, that's, that's where I'm at right now, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Anne? Well, I am not in support of the first letter. I, I think asking to defund 10% is not only realistic, but we do not know really how the department is working right now. Um, I'd rather see somebody do an audit on the department and really see how they're doing. I know they have statistics. I know they have boards that look over what they do. I'd really like to know how they are doing and hear from the public how they think they're doing. Um, and then, you know, I read the letter that Karen sent from, was it Dan? Karen? And, you know, he talked- Yeah, that was an e an email that Polly passed through from Dan. Yeah, oh, that's right, Polly sent it. And he, you know, he's talked about more work still needs to be done. I'd rather find out what that work is. You know, I'd rather ask council to really see how the department, the police department is doing and then see what still needs to be done. Because I, I, I don't think it's good to just label a department a certain way when they're, they may not be like that. It's like, I guess I take it kind of personally because a lot of people talk about social workers in that manner also. And I've worked really hard for like 20 years and it, it just feels like kind of a label to me without even knowing what kind of work I've done, without really knowing what kind of work the police department has done. And they, yes, they do take guns out to these calls and thank God, because I've been with them in the middle of the night, going into a home and having to take children out of the house when you just go in there and think it's just going to be a little talk with parents. And it becomes violent and scary, and you have to take kids out of the house. And so I think to just think that you could um, just hope that these calls will not be violent is just naive. Um, I, I just don't know what I would have done without them or what we would do without them. Um, and so I am not, I, I would, I'm glad that staff came up with another letter. I think the letter that you all did was really amazing. Um, I really liked it. I just can't really get on board with it. I think like Madeline, the work she's done with the Boulder Police Department is amazing. You know, what happened there was absolutely horrible. And I admire her for getting involved and, and you know, really putting herself out there to take care of that because she was asked to do it because um, they knew she'd do it a good job. But I, I just, I can't go along with it not knowing what how the department is working because I mean do you want to get in your car after people vomit all over in it do you want to be spit in the eye I mean the job is so hard and to not know how that department is really working or not I think it's just a slap in the face to say we're going to defund you Karen Phillips yeah I just uh did anybody see that editorial about that policeman that wrote in this morning in the times call he just yeah. commented that basically what he was saying in the end there is that the police could use more training, you know, that, and why couldn't we, you know, say something about taking that 10% and using it for training on mental health issues. You know, I, I don't know why 
maybe I see it too simply, but um, why we can't, you know, but the guy was just saying, you know, people want this and, and the police have given him that and people want this and the police have given him that. And he finally said, you know, we could use with more training. You know, the police officers could use more training on mental health. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Caitlin, and then Jake. I, gotta say I think to respond to that, um, there, is, there have been several studies done on anti-bias training and mental health training for police. And as far as I'm aware and what I've read, which I have actually read fairly extensively on this, there is zero indication that it reduces use of force or that it protects or reduces the number of black and brown people who are killed in this country. Zero evidence. There is an anecdote from a man, a black man who conducted anti-bias training for a police force in Texas. They were all in on that training. They did it for three years. They trained every police officer. They trained every member of their public safety team. That same police department, one of those officers he trained, attacked him during protests recently, broke his arm and put him in the hospital. That bias training did not protect that man from being hurt. And I totally get like the desire and the belief that training can do this, but I think that the training exists within the context of how policing works. And if it's not evidence-based, I don't think we should put our money into it. I don't think we should be putting our money into training folks in a way that we don't know actually protects members of our community, which I think is the thing that like, and also it ends up that like that training budget is still within the control of a police department, which means they're the ones who are picking who, who's doing it, how it's done, you know, those sorts of things. And I just, um, like, I, I, that's all I'll say about that. Thank you, Caitlin. Jake? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Just to echo a little bit of what Caitlin was saying, uh, if you go and look at some of the work from groups like A Can't Wait, um, you know, some other organizations that have worked on this issue, um, the, the data kind of reflects kind of that, that reality that, that what changes policing is not necessarily training, but is policy. Um, when policy changes are made, then, then that's the most effective way to get where we want to go. I, I think kind of just reflecting on, on what Ann said, and I really appreciate what Ann has to say. As I mentioned here before, you know, my dad was a cop in the city for 14 years. I, I recognize it's an awfully hard job. It broke him mentally. Um, it's a brutal job. But I think what we're asking the city to consider by sending this is, is, is not about any one department. It's not about Longmont. It's not about any one um, organization. It's about a system that isn't working. Um, it, it, it's not working. And how do we want to be a, be a leader as a community in addressing systematic reform? And how do we want to go above, you know, having a good police department, which I think we do, saying we're going to make some real systemic changes here that, that really can put us at the forefront of, of leading um, and asking questions about our cops, the, the right delivery system for human services, which is kind of what we're asking them to do right now, or are the nonprofits that we support the right delivery system for those human services? And are those dollars going to be more effectively utilized if we have additional resources to support those agencies? That's the core question I think we're asking. Um, I think the answer to that question is, is yes. I would ask that, um, I, I hope, you know, I, I'm ready to, to lead on that. And um, yeah, I think that's, that's all I'll say for tonight, unless something else comes up. But that's, yeah, I just I appreciate what Caitlin said a lot. Yeah. I mean, I get what you're saying, Jake, but you say it's not against any certain department, but it is because you're asking for two million from the Longmont Police Department. Yeah. Council Member Christensen. Oh, okay. I'm unmuted. <laughs> I finally got in. Sorry, I'm late. <laughs> I had a terrible time with the computer thing. Um, so I really think it's important that we have this conversation publicly. And I applaud Graham for bringing this forward. Um, it is a difficult conversation. 
but this is the time to do it. We can't lose momentum. I agree with Anne, however. I, we are trying to punish a department that has done nothing but try for at least a decade to do everything that it needs to do. You can say that we don't need a mental health person to go along with them on a ride along, but we do. We, the police are the front line of this. Nobody else gets called when somebody who has mental health problems um, that you love, who's part of your family, I mean, I know people who've done this, they, their kid goes bananas and he's a full grown person but he's living at home because he has autism or whatever and they call the police. If they don't mention to the police that this person is their son and that he has mental health problems, then the police will assume that this is just somebody who's threatening them. They have to, you have to tell them that this is a mental health person problem and then they will get somebody who specializes in de-escalating. And these are not people who are part of the police department. They are called, they are specialists who come along with the police that the police contracted with specifically to help them with this because these are people who understand how to de-escalate the situation. There isn't anybody else who's gonna do this because the police are the only people who do do this. They also they are the only connection with homeless people who are causing problems or whatever. The, you know, so they know how to connect them. They, they are, Sarah Aaron and um, David Kennedy have been doing this for years. They are very, they're very heartfelt people. They also don't put up with a lot of crap either but they will connect people who are homeless with hope. They'll connect them with Agape. They'll connect them with services from the Hour Center. They'll connect them with all these other things and they will try to help them. There isn't anybody else who's doing this and there isn't gonna be any, the mental, mental health partners doesn't go around and do this stuff because that's really not their job. This is in the police department's job. Instead of taking, and as I've said before, I've lived other places, and in my opinion, the, the Oakland police, for when I lived there 35 years ago, they should have been just eliminated top to bottom. They were racist scum. Likewise, the Denver Police Department, when I lived there 30 years ago, were just uh, scum. It takes leadership and it takes training, but it also does, and it, and, uh, implicit bias is part of that. I talked to Chief Butler about that six years ago, and he explained to me the training that they did because I I had been reading a reading about implicit bias. And um, anyway, I guess what I'm saying is, I want to have this conversation. It's timely. I don't want to lose momentum. We just lost John Lewis and C. T. Vickers, and these were great leaders in the civil rights movement. And we can't go backwards. We, we have to keep our finger on the pulse of holding people accountable. Plus, we're also hiring a new uh, chief of public safety. And that's very important. So this community needs to understand that we are not going to allow somebody to be hired who isn't aware of these issues and who's not going to be hiring the right people. That's where it starts, is hiring the right people. If you, don't hi if you hire somebody who's a racist to begin with, no amount of training is going to fix that. And the, I believe our department has tried very, very hard to get the right people in the first place. But I do think it's useful to have this letter. I think it's useful to have this discussion. I think it cannot ever do any harm for this community to understand um, and have it reiterated what this police department does do and what they should not be expected to keep doing, but what they also do do. Most of the homeless people, I think it's like 35% of the people who are homeless are homeless because of domestic violence. When the police go to a home where there's domestic violence happening, 
they have no idea what's going to happen. No idea. They have to have a gun. I don't like that. Nobody, who, who would do that job? Very few of us would do that job. It's really difficult. I, if I had a family, I would not put myself in that position, but they do. And we need them. So we need to, they need to know we hold them accountable and we need to know the stuff that they do. And this is a good way to start the conversation. Whether I agree with everything in the letter is irrelevant. This is a way to have that conversation. And so I, I applaud doing that. Anyway, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Caitlin? Hi. <clears throat> Sorry, I feel like I ha have said a lot here and I don't want to make sure that other folks have um, room to speak as well. I think um, a couple of things stood out to me from what Councilwoman Christensen said. Um, the first is I think um, the assumption that a reduction in funding is a punishment for police, I think is a really dangerous um, way to think about how we fund various things in our city and in our communities. Reducing funding is not a punishment. It's a reallocation of our priorities. When we reduce school funding, it's not because we're punishing schools. When we reduce funding to other areas, it's not because we're punishing people for that. In the same way that allocating additional funds is not necessarily us saying, you have done the most amazing job, it's because we're reallocating our priorities. And I think to me, like that is a really important mental space to be in, is that taking funding or saying that we should reallocate funding from the police is not to say it's because you personally have done a bad job. It's because we are saying our priority is on funding these community services. Whether you've done a good job or not, whether that should be part of your job is, is up for debate. Um, I also think like, there was a mention about um, some people are the only ones who are in contact with homeless folks who are causing issues. And my, my response to that is a little bit like, why are they the only ones? If we, of course, in some ways, there's not gonna be anyone else when that's where we're putting our funding. There's no opportunity for alternatives when we are saying that they are the only ones and can be the only ones. Um, and the final thing I guess is, um, I think it's great to hire somebody, a, a head of uh, public safety, who is gonna look for hiring the right people. But my husband's life, my children's life, m other members of our community who are black and brown, they cannot rely on us happening to hire the right people. We need systemic changes so that, because like a neighbor calls the cops on my husband because they don't recognize him because he's black in a mostly white neighborhood. I can't rely on the fact that he's gonna be lucky and get a police officer who is not gonna turn that violent. I, I, I can't rely on that. Like that does not, that is not something that I can sleep with at night and knowing that that's our protection for members of our community. And I think to that extent, it, it means that like, we need alternatives that people can call. We need ways to, we need systems that are holding them accountable. And it's not clear to me that we necessarily have those systems when we're piling a whole bunch of different um, jobs into the police. Um, one of the ways to hold police accountable and others is by actually separating those job duties, right? So like, Anne, you're a social worker, having what you do be separate and sort of your scope of practice, your scope of practice doesn't include arresting people. Um, you know, as in the same way, having police like very limiting the scope of their practice is one way we hold accountable and we make sure that we can keep members of our community safe. Thank you, Caitlin. Karen Phillips, did you have, did you raise your hand? Well, well, no, it's just, um, you know, as far as I think the conversation needs to be had for sure. And, you know, we, however that, that can happen because you know, we know issues, but like Caitlin was just saying, you know, who's to know when you knock on the door if there's, there's an issue? And, you know, I mean, how, how is, who, who, are you gonna, who are you gonna turn to if you're not gonna turn to the police? And if a policeman comes to the door, 
like Ann said, you know, who knows what's going to be behind that door. And you're not going to be able to just have a social worker appear out of nowhere to help the situation out. These are spontaneous things that happen immediately. And, you know, the conversation needs to be had. And, you know, I think we've got to find ways of, you know, we can sit here and talk about this, but there's no solutions that are happening. So if we open the door to conversations because, like Madeline said, you know, there's a great pool of people that we should be able to come up with something. But it, it's really complicated, and I suppose we need to, you know, start the conversation. Thank you. Diana, did you raise your hand? This is not an easy conversation to have, right? And I think generally the consensus is that the police in Longmont have done a great job with a lot of different things. One of the issues that I had is that, as I said at our last meeting, I, I don't truly know that as a, as, a, as a white person experiencing what the police are like in Longmont. That's one of the things that I suggested we include in that letter is that the police do, or that the city um, does some investigation and figure out exactly how people in the community are experiencing the police. Um, but I also am very hesitant to jump onto the pattern that I think a lot of white people suffer from, which is like overstudy, 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 right? Like we can study this. People have studied this for a while now and things are not changing. I, I think there's a lot of value in taking an approach that's going to encourage conversation. Do I think that they're going to take 10% of the budget and give it to us? No, they're, they're not going to do that. It's a non-starter. Um, do I think that there's probably going to be some people who are feeling defensive and feeling offended, like we are blaming them? Probably that's the case. And that's unfortunate because I don't think that's anybody's intention. I think at least on the subcommittee, I can say for myself that the goal here was really to encourage a conversation, to try and make people think about securing funding for for nonprofits, but to also really encourage a conversation about systemic change in our country. And I think there's a lot of value to having that conversation. I guess that's all I'll say about it. Thank you. Anybody else? Graham? Graham, Council Member Christensen. So I, I don't feel like staff's letter will start the conversation. I mean, I think it's well written and I appreciate their time and effort in that. Um, I just don't think it will start the conversation we want to. So, um, if it's appropriate, Chair, I'll motion we submit the first letter. Second. Okay, Councilmember Christensen, you you wanted to speak. Um, I like Deanna. I mean, Deanna brought up a very good. Um, idea. You know, Chief Butler and Dan Benavides have been walking around the neighborhoods for <clears throat> years and talking to people. And uh, I've gone on these things and many people have gone on these, these things. And what Marta Moreno said to me is, oh, they're not going <laughs> to tell him what they think. And you know, that's true. You know, when somebody's walking around the neighborhood, you're not going to say, you know, you cops are like, there, there should be a way that we could start a conversation that would be um, anonymous where people could call in because this, because we're in the process of hiring somebody and you don't hire, you can't make policy based on personality. You have to make policy based on having standard protocol. The police, when there is a use of force, you have to um, have a policy for that. Otherwise, everybody just does what they feel like, and that is not a good, that is not a policy. Um, but having some anonymous thing, can, can, since we can't have a, an open forum, and people would not be, many of the people who came to that would not Many of the people who have had bad experiences with the police would not come to an open forum, would not feel comfortable trying to say what has happened to them with the police. They would be comfortable if they had an anonymous um, way that they could uh, 
submit some information about their experiences with the police. And I certainly know that my experience is not uh, the same as other people. For instance, I went to a conference a few years ago. Um, my son forgot that I was, uh, did, that he had the keys and he locked me out of the house because I showed up earlier than was expected and I had to break into my own house. Now, Henry Louis Gates, who's very well known, got arrested for breaking into his own house because he lost his key. Um, but he got arrested because he was black. I probably, I was thinking when I, as I was breaking into my house in high heels and a skirt and up a stepladder, that I probably believe somebody might call the police on me but probably not, you know? So my experience is very different, and I know that. But we need to hear from people anonymously about what their experience has been as whatever, whatever, um, whether it's as a woman, as someone who's gay, as somebody who's Latino, as somebody who's black, whatever. Some anonymous way that they, we can know whether they feel that they have been uh, unfairly treated by our police department. That's the only way we'll ever find out. So I, I thought Deanna's suggestion about um, a way to do that would be an interesting thing. I'm not sure how to do that, but um, because it's hard to get a hold of the people who should be telling us their stories. They don't interact often with people because they don't trust them because they're badly treated. So, you know, why would they trust people? Anyway, I, I, I'm going to check into seeing how we can do that. Thank you. I'll just throw in a couple thoughts real quick. Uh, so from listening to everybody, uh, you know, one thing is clear. Everybody wants a safer community. And I think part of the, uh, certainly the intention of either letter is to drive towards a solution for a safer community. Um, the one of the principal intentions we're showing in this is that we believe we can get there by having greater levels of human services funding. Um, and I certainly agree with, with both of those. My concern, my own concerns with the 10% are that, uh, first, I, I do think it'll provoke a conversation. I have no doubt about that. Uh, I think it will very much be perceived as punitive. And I, I feel like part of that is because we don't really have precise targets for how that money would be used. Um, so it, it's really a pretty round number. So it really ends up taking on a symbolic meaning rather than a practical meaning in terms of how does this money create a safer community? And, you know, I, um, what I would love to wave my magic wand uh, and make happen, I don't have one, but if I had one, I would wave it and say, uh, you know, what is the path to a safer community in terms of like, I, I worry that if there are, let's say that that taking 10% away means fewer police on the street. I, I don't know what would happen. Honestly, I don't know what losing that amount of funding would mean, but let's say it meant fewer police, then my question is, well, are our human services agency currently actually equipped to deal with the kinds of situations the police are going into? Or do they need training in order to be equipped to go into these more volatile situations? And if so, are we asking for funds to train those human or service agencies? Is there a transition plan from the police as a partner moving responsibilities away from them and towards non-police, non-armed elements of our community, uh, that's what I, you know, I would think, okay, let's have a transition plan. And so I fear that this will be perceived as punitive and it'll put us at odds with the police department who actually serves as a 
critical partner in a lot of the services that do happen. Granted, a, a relatively imperfect partner. So th those are just, you know, some of my own concerns, but I, I think whatever, however this vote goes, we certainly can acknowledge that we do want a safer and a better community. And there is a sense of urgency around doing this. Uh, and there is a moment that we need to capture. So, um, you know, I think the, the disagreements tend to come in exactly how to do that to the best possible effect. And frankly, we don't know. I mean, there is this, <laughs> this is a new conversation for everybody. We just don't know. Um, so that's my 10 cents. Um, Mr. Marsing. And, I and have that, a, if, okay. go ahead, sorry, no, go ahead. Go ahead. ahead. Go ahead, Madeline. Oh, okay. Now I'm wondering, having heard everybody, now I'm wondering, should we be sending a letter at all? And you had to drop the bomb, didn't you? <laughs> well, I mean, and then the other side of that is Karen is going to be asked by counsel, what does she think? She told us what she thinks. So why are we doing anything? I don't, uh, now I'm questioning uh, um, our intent. Thank you. Jake? And counsel, and counsel may not ask me. So I've just said, if, then that's what, how I would answer. They might not ask. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. I actually had a practical question for Karen and Alberto and staff. What, what happens from here with this, if anything? Um, I mean, does this go to city manager and the mayor and say, when do we want to do we want to put this on an agenda? What what is it? Does it just get sent? What 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 happens if we were to adopt the first letter? What what happens? Uh, you know, I would say um, I I would say that would be part of the you know the direction from the advisory board what you want to have happen. I think I did that. Well, I think. Holly had suggested that we, you know, council, we show up for the meeting, blah, blah, blah. So I think, I think it'll be part of whatever letter you adopt or whatever, then it's like, that's the first part. And then how do we want to, how do you want to deliver that? So council member Christensen has some ideas about that, but I think, you know, that's, that's something that and council member christensen you you have the floor and i'm going to quickly escape to the restroom and be back but don't let my my short absence stop you from talking okay um two things anybody who wants to see how the police spend their money can look at the the budget it's public information and it's broken down into line items of you know this much is spent on radios, this much is spent on video or cameras, this much is spent on software upgrades, this much is spent on salaries, this much is spent on pensions, etc. cetera. Um, so that might uh, be informative to some people. Um, I would think that this would be sent to um, the city manager uh, and the city clerk for distribution to city council. And then I would think we would put it on the agenda. I, I uh, think that unless we do that, it won't be put on the agenda because uh, I asked for about two months ago for a presentation on the police department's use of force. That hasn't happened. <laughs> um, Anyway, yeah, I think we should do this because we need to keep the momentum of this moment going to have these discussions, however difficult they are. Nothing happens unless you have difficult conversations. I mean, nothing happens. So let's have a difficult conversation. Wow, Brian, you're fast. I'm impressed. 
I told you. I told you just a short moment. <laughs> but, you know, women are, we're just much slower. <laughs> and I washed my hands. Jake? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm struggling with this a little bit because I, I think our intent here is, is righteous. Our intent here is good. Um, I, I am struggling with a couple of points, and this is this is just kind of where I'm at. I, I, I want if we're going to send one of these two letters, I would rather it be the first letter. My challenge is if we send this from the board on what looks like will be a divided vote, um, a divided conversation, and then if if staff has their own reservations about it and is asked to comment on it, and this isn't you know just comment at all about about staff, I, I would you know, staff's entitled to their opinion, but I recognize that we don't necessarily have, you know, if we send the first letter, the strongest advocate for it, potentially presenting it to council, they can present it and we can be there to argue our case, what have you. Um, I, I'm, I'm struggling with, I'm struggling with that a little bit. And I, I don't necessarily want to send something when we're divided and have, um, staff go in with their own issues with it. And, and I don't know if that represents us as well as, po as it possibly can. I don't know if that represents. So I guess I'm going to voice those concerns. I'm still, I mean, I obviously seconded the motion. And I'm still in favor of it, but I'm going to voice those concerns. And I'd love to hear from members of the board on those two specific issues about whether, you know, we individually can advocate for these positions or whether, because my hope had been in, in, and I was the one who made the motion for the subcommittee, my hope had been that we could construct something that would get unanimous support. Um, so I'm struggling a little bit with that, so. Thank you, so Anne and then Karen Phillips. I guess I would rather see us take a little bit more time and really think, you know, I'm hearing what Madeline said, like, where are we at this point? I would like to see real change in the community. I would like to find out if and what the problems are in the police department in Longmont. And then I would like to spend some time, maybe it's a community meeting, or maybe what Polly said, you know, surveys are sent out. Um, I do that all the time at work and it's amazing what you get back if it's anonymous and you can just, you know, get information that way and then really see what change we need to do. You know, much more, I guess that's how I'd like to see it. I'd like to explore how things are working in the Longmont Police Department, whether that's city council checking it out or community members, or maybe there's already a committee that does that, finding out what the needs are, and then finding out what people in the community say about it, and then going from there. But I just think sending these letters is not the way to go. Thank you, Anne. So it's Karen Phillips and then Karen Roney. Well, I just, how is the best way how is the best thing to do to get the conversation going? You know, how do we get the conversation going? By, you know, by this letter or, you know, like Polly, she knows with the city council, but, you know, if it doesn't get on the agenda and that kind of thing, but, you know, how do we get the conversation going where, where they're not defensive and all that kind of thing and we're, you know, dividing the police against the human services. So how, how could we start the conversation? What would be the best way to do it? Yeah. Great question. All right, so let, let's treat that rhetorically for a moment, Karen, and then Karen Roney and, and Polly. So, you know, what I want to um, speak to is that there's been So, um, you, Karen. You're cutting in and out. Just lean right into it. Oh, <laughs> so I want to speak to Jake's point about. Um, about, about staff and I'll just speak for me. So, so what I just want to tell you is that it's not our role to work actively against what the advisory board wants to do. And, and we would not do that. So, so I can, but sometimes it's not all the time is that what I just wanted to make sure that if, if we were asked, you know, what do you think 
we would say something along what, what's in the letter. But we would not have a role um, to actively advocate against whatever the, the board chooses. That. So I did, I appreciate you making that comment and that I wanted to clarify that. But I just, I also wanted to be transparent as I said, hey, um, what do you think? We would pretty much go with about everything that you have in your letter except for that template. That, that's all, but we would not work against it. That, that's not our role. Thank you, Karen. Council Member Christensen. Um, I also, several weeks ago, I said, oh, let's go down the stick and get this in by the August 1st because we'll be back in the council chambers. Well, the council chambers are all done, but, you know, we can't really use them the right way. And so we're not going to be back in there until September. And that makes it difficult to present something like this. But I, I still think it's timely and I would say bring it forward. But that means that what you should, everyone, instead of us being able to actually have a conversation in a room together like normal people and be able to see each other's faces, you'll only see city council and staff uh, visually, and then everyone else would have to call in. But I would advise you, if this letter does come before council, to all the people who advocate for it, to call in and um, talk about why you, why this board um, would like to see some discussion on this topic. Um, but that means, you know, everybody coming and talking, uh, uh, well, phoning in and talking, which is not terribly onerous, but, you know, <laughs> it isn't what I would like to see, which is a big, happy family having a big discussion or having a big community forum where we could sit at different tables and people might be more comfortable saying, well, when uh, I was walking down the street one day, and I think that solely because I was Latino, uh, somebody called the police saying I was doing something suspicious and the police did this and this and this to me. And I'm telling you this, this exists in Longmont. Um, I think that will never happen. People aren't gonna come to public invited to be heard in city council and say that. They will do that maybe in a smaller group. The only way we'll, f but anyway, it is what it is. We have this uh, virus and we have to diminish it and we will, but meanwhile, we have to cope with what we have. But we also simultaneously have a, a crisis going on in all over this country in the fact that White people can now see on phones and videos black people have been seeing their whole lives. And we have to address it. Graham. If we change the 10% to 5%, would Ann, staff, and um, Karen, would you guys be in more support of the letter than, than I'm surmising you are now? Ann. No. no, no, Karen. Meh. Yeah. You know, I don't know if that's really my. <laughs> so I, I just, I, <laughs> I, I just, I think you know, it's it's really that re redirecting. I think it's important to have a conversation. All these things. Um, well, you know, five is less than ten. I just think it's the, but it's the, it's it's the concept of, of directing. I think that we have other, again, it's not, it's not my letter, so, um, so. You know, I'm willing, if everyone else wants to do the first letter, I'm willing to, <clears throat> if I'm the only dissenting voice, I'm willing to step aside, um, if that's what you all want to do. I've been at this for two and a half years, and if it's important to you all, 
and you want and you know you want it all to be together and i'm the dissenting voice i'm happy to just step aside well i i would just um thank you ann um i would suggest that there's no need certainly to have anybody step aside because they're in disagreement with you know elements of what's being voted on i mean that that's why we have a vote and that's why we have a quorum and a majority carries and um you know in regards to us having differences of opinion uh, that makes us more like a real family than the actual happy family that that um you know we probably would all like to think we are um and i do think related to uh, council member christensen's um, strong suggestion that whatever if if this if a letter goes in front of council that we support it well we we are there to comment on it as members we all can still have a voice without saying i don't support it right i mean it, it's i think everybody can say you know th this is what i uh, this was a hard decision. Uh, it's complicated. Here's why we voted yes. And here are concerns that, you know, of course, we're going to need to address. Um, so anyway, and I, I just really hope that you feel like you would need to step aside because um, you voted against a measure. Madeline? I've heard that our purpose should be to start conversation. And I'm just, do we need to revise the letter? To say that, or to say something that would uh, bring that about? Because right now, I'm kind of, <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking we probably shouldn't send either one. Thank you. Thank you, Madeline. Um, Karen, and then Karen Phillips, and then I have a comment I'd like to add. So go ahead, Karen. I feel like Ann. It's like I don't want to vote on it either because I just, uh, you know, I, I want to support, but I want this. But I'm just saying, if the letter starts the conversation, if that's the only thing that will start the conversation, then we should vote yes to send the letter. If that's the only way the conversation is going to start. But I feel like Ann too is like, well, I don't know if I should even vote on this because I don't want to be the Debbie Downer going, no, I don't want to do this. But the conversation needs to be started, so I don't know. Thank you. Uh, I do have one question, and it's directed at Caitlin and, and Madeline. And, and um, you know, I'm really asking this in the utmost sincerity because I'm not in a position where I have to worry about my safety. Um, so I don't have that lens, I don't have that perspective. And my question is, and it's really kind of a clarifying question, if the department, if, the, if this letter successfully uh, reduced funding of the Longmont police by 10%, do you feel that 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 does make in itself the community safer? And I, I that's not intended to put anybody on the spot. I'm sorry. I almost am sorry for asking it, but I, I'm really trying to get down to questions. some of the intentions and underlying motivations uh, behind what we're doing and what we're talking about to understand that piece of it a little bit better. Because if you said yes, I'd, I'd back it in a second, I have to tell you. Well, there was um, a building burned down a few, few weeks ago. And I think it was that Hilton, that new Hilton that's over. At any rate, I, I, I don't know for sure which one, but there was a building that burned that someone put uh, set on fire and KKK was written on the front for what was left of the building. 
Mm-hmm. When I ask, or when my sister asked Chief Butler about that and how, what had they investigated, he didn't know. He didn't know about it. Oh, one other thing: the owner is black. I, I left that little tidbit out. But um, so to answer your question, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, for for my own piece of it, um, I think so. The amount isn't of a particular concern to me. Uh, it's more understanding how that amount is going to generate change, the change that we're all wanting. And so I, I do, for a large part, go back to this idea of, you know, if, if we said we would like to see 10% of funding redirected to um, moving uh, police activities and social services into social services with court, I don't know what the hell to say, you know, corresponding training, blah, 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 whatever, right? Um, to me, that would feel much more comfortable because we would have a clear idea of why, why we want to move that money. And, uh, and Caitlin, I really, your point about, you know, the, the psychology of having guns, using, being prepared to use force, having that as a primary tool in the toolbox, uh, you know, it, it struck me. I mean, that that is a, uh, we're seeing that with the militarization of our police force and increasingly these movements towards more and more hostile reactions to community events. Um, and that is, I mean, that's, that's real. And that's what we don't want. Um, how do we affect change in that? Uh, Caitlin. Um, I wanted to ask if others have seen, there's um, <clears throat> there's a document that's put out by um, a group called Critical Resistance um, that basically talks about, um, and I'm, I'm happy to share it with staff to send to folks. Um, it's one, it's a, it's a lens for looking through, looking at funding decisions and whether they sort of increase the likelihood of the use of violence versus adequately funding alternatives. Um, it's something that I, I learned about a couple of years ago, but has been really helpful for me to sort of like frame thinking around this, these kind of questions. Um, and I'm, I'm just, I guess my question is if folks have heard of it, and one of the things it looks at is, does this funding increase um, power of police in a community or does this funding um, increase community power um, around safety for example uh, and so there there are some examples for example one example would be like putting more money into building more prisons is a way that you sort of transfer more power into prisons and police um, without necessarily um, having clear indication that that makes communities safer um, and then there's a contrast to like funding more housing and human services and what that looks like. And um, so I don't know if anyone else has seen um, that like framing of funding, but um, it's something that I think m might be interesting for folks to look at if you haven't seen it before. Yeah, thank you. That sounds spot on. Anne? I think we should vote soon because it's getting late. <laughs> But I wanted to say maybe what we should do at this point is I'm really proud of the conversations we've had tonight and the other night. Like I just, it's hard. And I, I'm just, Madeline said it's not very um, complicated. In some ways it's not complicated at all. But it, it's, I'm just proud of all of us for being able to do this. And so maybe the next step is just having city council watch these and see how it's weighing on our hearts and seeing how much 
as community members, we really like, Caitlin, I just feel for you and the situation you and your family are in, but I have my own feelings about the police department and I just think it's really heavy, but inspiring as well. And maybe they should watch this, but I think we should vote too. Yeah, thank you, Anne. Jake. A question for Council Member Christensen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think we've all kind of said tonight that, that what we want, including folks who support sending the first letter, at least I'll, I won't speak for others, I'll speak for myself. Um, I want to start a conversation about policing and I want to ask our council to think about not the way things as they are, not about the great work David Kennedy does or about the good work that a lot of our Longmont Police Department does but ask hard questions about whether that's really how the system should operate and, or, and whether that $2.1 million we're talking about would be better used in the nonprofit human services sector than in the hands of law enforcement. That's the question I think I wanna ask. So, my, my, but I also don't wanna have a conversation that, and I am, I agree with you, Anne, I'm very proud of the board and the work that we've done. Um, and I appreciate the work of staff as well. I don't want that conversation to be, I don't want our decision to send a letter that is potentially very difficult because I know what happens when things go in front of council to become a partisan political fight where everybody runs to their corners very quickly and where the city just, I don't think that serves our interest, right? Because what council would, I, I would think would be inclined to do in that case is probably try and I don't know if put it in a drawer is the right sense, but try and minimize the impact of what we're doing if it comes from us. So I guess my question for council member Christensen would be, do you council member need a letter to, to start this conversation, to start this dialogue about structural change and about funding police, or is this potentially something that council can take upon itself under the advisement of this advisory board and say, Hey, we want this conversation to happen. We want you to carry this, this, we're passing this torch on to you and say, hey, we really want to see this happen. We want this conversation to be had. Could you do that? Or do you need this letter? If you say you need this letter, I'm going to hold up my, my support of it and send it your way. I would just think that, so I'll ask the question, do you think you need this letter to start that conversation? Uh, yeah, I do think I do, because I've been trying to get them to uh, do a presentation on the protocol for police force, police use of force, for months. And I keep getting kind of stiffed. And um, I, uh, they said, oh, well, you know, it's on, the, it's on the website. That's not good enough, you know. <laughs> it's not good enough. Nobody cares what's on the website. It's you have to have a public discussion about it. And if the, this board, which has spent several meetings now discussing this, really feels strongly about, they want to have a public, communi a, a public discussion about it, that would be very helpful. Because I can tell you, the minute I bring up something, uh, there will be three city council members who will oppose whatever I do just on general principle. Um, so it would be good to have this board that has spent a lot of, who are all intelligent people and have spent a lot of time reflecting upon this, uh, send a letter. The other thing that had occurred to me is that we have Longmont Public Media and we can do whatever we want to with that. They're looking for content. We could, we could um, put together a community forum and have some people... Uh, I mean, it's difficult with COVID, but we could figure out a way to do that and get some people from, say, El Comité, from Cirque, from um, Hope, from the Hour Center, people to talk about, you know, because wealthy white people don't have a problem with the police. It's poor people who have a problem with the police. So um, find people who are usually served by um, the very services we're talking about, you know, human services, and um, have them talk about their experiences 
either members of the uh, who actually do the work, not the board members, but the actual people like Joseph and Mark who are doing the work, um, talk about what their experience is with uh, their clients and the police, or better yet, get people off the street who are willing to talk about their experience. That's a way we can use public media to actually say what we would like to say instead of having it filtered through the courtesy of the bureaucracy, which is what city council is. Do you know what I mean? It's, um, it's one way we could con actually have more of a robust discussion, I think. It, I, I just don't think we can discuss this enough. We just have to keep discussing uh, the reality of the situation of different groups of people in our society, because it's very, very different. Thank you. So Madeline wanted to say something, then we'll go to Jake and then we'll call for a vote. All right, I just wanted to correct um, what I said about the building that burned. It did not burn down, it burned. Uh, and significant damage was is at Ken Pratt near the roundabout. That's the location. And also I wanted to add that of those organizations that Polly mentioned, we now have an NAACP, just so you know. Thank you. All right, thank you, Madeline. Jake? And just to follow up for Councilmember Christensen, just to be 100% clear um you're saying that you you believe you do need this specific letter with the 10 percent request to start this conversation or do you are you saying you need the support of the board to start this conversation you need something from the board in order to to go in this direction because i, I just because i'm hearing i'm hearing you you want the board's backing and support and i think we could all get there I want to be 100% certain that, that you think that we need to have this specific letter as the starting point. And if you do, then I'll, I'll support calling the question and moving forward. I don't know about this specific letter, but in order to have it heard before city council and start a conversation with city council, which is important to, as far as I think all of us agree, um, we need to ha make a strong statement. I think this makes a strong statement. I don't happen to agree with taking 10% away from the, the police department. I would have us try to find 10% more to give to human services. That's the problem, is that human services is chronically underfunded, and we all know that. Um, but anyway, having this discussion means we need a strong letter. I think this is a strong letter it does not make the slightest difference whether I agree with it or not. This is a way to have that conversation, I think. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's call the vote. Oh, sorry, Caitlin. Sorry, I have one more clarifying question for Councilwoman Christensen. Um, what I hear you saying is that um, having board and or potentially community support for this conversation is what you're really looking for so that you are not sort of a lone voice like beating a drum to have the conversation. Is that correct? And to that end, is there, um, because I am hearing that there are differences in sort of how folks want to approach this. Um, I wonder if the call from the board is really about how do we have that conversation as a community about shifting of funds without necessarily putting a number on it, number one. And number two, whether there's a, a community-driven um, call for this. Because I think that there are members of our community mm -hmm. that are asking for this conversation to happen, but they are not the folks who are on boards. They are not the folks who are writing to city council. They are not the folks who are in like mm -hmm. the types of conversations that we're having. But I think that there are a lot of folks who support having these conversations. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I'm just thinking about like 
I've seen instances where people have sort of had a public thing where people can sign on and they share it with mm -hmm. their friends and so forth. And so it's really a call for that conversation. Mm -hmm. It sounds to me like that, like you don't necessarily need this specific letter to have that conversation, but that it needs to be something that is more community led and not Polly Christensen banging the drum to get city council to agree to have this conversation. Is that an accurate? Well, what I'm saying is we need to have this conversation in many, many venues. One of them is city council, because if you send this letter, it will make the police department have to come and do a presentation, which they have not done for a while. And they need to, they need to be answering these questions and responding. And I think they would be happy to do that. But right now, I, I don't know if it's just because they are in the midst of having a hiring a new public safety chief, but uh, it's important to hear from the police and this will get the police to come do a presentation before city council, answer some questions, have this conversation for the, for the members of city council to examine what our, what our accountability is, what our budget is, many, many things. That's one venue, but we need to have, as you say, a community conversation in lots of different venues, which of course is really very difficult right now because of COVID. But as I said, we could use the Longmont public media to have a small group of people have a forum and we could keep doing this, you know, week after week, have this conversation. They're always looking for content, so let's give them some content. <laughs> Thank you, Jake. I, I guess my question is, are we sure that that will be the outcome, council member? Are we sure that, that us sending this letter will actually get the police department down to council more than the community push and council's, uh, a majority of council's insistence? I guess I just am not, my, my challenge right now is, um, I hear the, the, the concerns of the board and I hear, you know, the concerns of, I, I hear these concerns. So I, 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 my, I guess my question is, will it though? Will, will it actually create that outcome? Cause I'm not in my head confident that it would, um, that it would get them down there more than what you've already done, which is ask for them to come down there. And I, 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 I suspect that was a motion that was made and that the full majority of council supported or not. No. Go ahead, Polly. You're on, you're on mute. I don't remember whether that was a motion. That was a suggestion to the city manager, but I don't think it went beyond that. I don't think anything's, you know, it's just right now, everything is very, very, backed up and difficult. However, I don't see any public outcry. So let's get, let's have, this is a community advisory board. This is a board that is public, that is, that's part of the job is to give city council your advice. And, and so give your advice. Yeah. That's all I'm saying, because no, there's no guaranteed outcome on anything in life, Jake. But, you know, this is, this is one thing we can do, and it will get something, some discussion going. And we have to keep the momentum going to have a discussion about how safe... You're on mute again. Nicole, did you mute council member Christensen out of spite? Okay. <laughs> no. I'm typing away. I don't even have an extra hand. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is sort of, it's hot and we're all trying to figure out what's going on and we're getting to, it's getting late and we're hungry and the pizza's on its way. And anyway, um, so be an advisory board, advise council that they need to have this discussion that they need a presentation from the police department about what they do, what they don't do. We need to have this public conversation. This is one way we can have it. There are many other ways and we all need to pursue them. So. 
if I may, uh, just real quick, um, you know, there there is a potentially easy amendment to the first letter we could make, which is to say that the board uh, strongly urges council. Um, so council explore the role of of policing in the community, the allocation of resources, uh, you know, given all of the background that's been given, right? And essentially to say in lieu of that, if, you know, in, in lieu of that conversation starting an actual meaningful progress being made, uh, we ask that 10% be immediately allocated. And the intention there is simply to say, this this needs to happen. We're clear on that. And if you can't have it, if it's just going to, if we're going to drag our feet on it, then let's just take 10% and move it because something has to happen. Caitlin? I, I, I think that like that idea of like revising the letter in a way that says like, we need to be having these conversations, not just this board. This board has spent a lot of time on it. And I think it's really important to actually share even that with city council to say like, this is a conversation that's important in our community. City council should be having this conversation. Other boards and um, committees should be having this conversation in our city. Our community should be having these conversations. And, you know, and if we're not willing to engage in those conversations, yes, let's just do something. Because if like the conversations would would are are better, I think than than just like transferring funds. But like if you're not going to have the conversation, do something and just be done with it. Like if you don't want to engage the public and the community on these questions, here's a quick way you can just be done with that conversation and not have to like get into the sort of weeds and the mud of it because it is like it's it's hard stuff. Um, so I really, I actually really like that idea of if the idea is to really generate conversation is to actually push for that and push for council, you know, have the police in there talking about it and to have other community members in there talking about it. But if they don't want to do that and it's not like a priority, then do something else, <laughs> but make it clear that something is being done. Well, let's do this. It's late. Anne said that half an hour ago. It's still true. Uh, so let's go ahead and call for a vote. And uh, so the motion on the table is to submit the, the first letter as written to City Council. All those in favor? No, go, go ahead, Mr. Chair. Um, sorry, I just, I, I just need to say on the record real quick before we vote. Um, after the conversation that I've heard tonight, I, I, and I really appreciate it, I'm just, I'm not convinced that the reasons that I've supported this, um, this process, and I really appreciate Graham bringing forward, um, I'm not convinced, even though I, I seconded the motion after listening and, and hearing from everybody, I'm not convinced that this particular letter is going to serve our goals in the way that, that we want them to be served. I don't, I'm not convinced that, um, that this letter is going to do more than start a partisan conversation. And um, that concerns me a great deal. Um, so I, I am going to vote no right now. And I want us to continue. And I, I, I can explain more. I, I want this to happen. I want the conversation. And I don't want people running to their corners. And that's what worries me right now. Um, so I, I, I'm happy. That's where I'm at. And then we can continue. Yeah, that's where I'm at. I agree. Thank you, Jake. Okay, I, and my uh, my expertise on Robert's Rules of Order runs uh, an inch deep and about two feet wide. I don't even make it the mile. So I'm thinking there is still a second on the table. So we will call the vote. So all those in favor of submitting the letter to council as is, please raise your hand, leave them raised so Nicole can make a record of your, um, your vote. Great. All those opposed?
Any abstentions? I didn't know what Madeline did. Yeah, Madeline. Madeline. I'm go I'm I'm abstaining. You're abstaining. Okay. Yes. Nicole, my rudimentary finger math tells me that the motion did not pass. You are correct. Okay. Um, okay, so it's late. And one thing I do know, outside of the fact that it's late, is that we are all agreed something needs to happen. Yes. It wasn't this exact manifestation, but something needs to happen. Uh, Council Member Christensen, do you have a recommendation? Or uh, yeah, at the next meeting, which is a regular session, I'm going to recommend that we have this discussion. I'm going to explain that we have had this extensive conversation, and uh, recommend that we have a police a presentation with the police because uh, we need to ha have this community conversation. Thank you. So, and I, I would like to work with Anne maybe about trying to do, get some community survey things since you say that you've um, been doing that. I think we, we could do that through the city, but I, I, my experience with that is that it's the same people again and again who respond to the city and they are uh, usually not the people who are having problems. Maybe not. It's a different anyway. time. It's a different time. Yeah. All right, let's go Jake and then Karen Roney. I want to make a motion, Mr. Chair. Um, if Councilmember Christensen is going to do that, I want to move, in fact, I do move, um, that this board offer in our record, I, I, don't, I don't know quite how to phrase it, and if anyone has some phraseology advice, I would take it support for council member Christensen bringing up this discussion forward and bringing it to council um, and a some kind of an acknowledgement that we would like this community conversation to take place um, that is reflected in our record so I'll make that motion and if someone has a better way of phrasing it I would accept that a second, a second. okay thank you so we'll go into discussion real quick uh, Karen Roney So the only thing, um, the one thing that I wanted to just uh, mention, and a couple of uh, folks have, have really uh, talked about it, is the, the value um, of the conversation that this advisory board has had tonight and roughly two weeks ago. Um, you know, I think it is. We might want to think about how to how to create um, or include or or. Holly could suggest, you know, a link to our, our last two meetings where this comes. I have referred people to go um, to look at our conversation last last time about how to have a, a converse a challenging conversation about a very challenging topic. Have people listen and knowledge, respect even shift their, their beliefs. You all were amazing. Um, and I was, and I think several of you talked about how proud you were to be part of this body. And, um, and I think tonight is also a, a great example. So, so I think there is value at, at some point to figure out how to share this link in a way for, for folks to really look at. This is, this is, how you have these conversations. Um, this is, and these are the ingredients of having difficult conversations about helping people understand their ideas. It's done amazing work. Thank you, Karen. Um, Nicole. Did we have a motion on the table about? Yeah, I just wanted to see if Nicole could, uh, if you recorded what Jake said so we can get a clear motion. Yeah, I might need a little help. So it sounds like it just was motioned for community conversation to be included in the advisory board's record. Is that what you wanted? So, so that's... Um, oh, yeah. go ahead, Jake, and then... 
Oh, Alberto, if you have a, if you were kind of on the same. I had, I had, I had a thought. I have, I'm not sure if it's exactly what you're saying, but I did have a thought. So, so what I understood from the motion, the motion is to formally support Councilman Christensen to bring this conversation to City Council, and that it will be recorded in this board's official record. That's the way I understood it. That's a better way to phrase it. Yeah, that's what I'm after. Thank you. Sorry. No. Okay. Uh, no further discussion. Let's go ahead and take a vote. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Hold on. <laughs> I'm coming. <laughs> or you can just say yes. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Thank you, Madeline. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the motion passes. Uh, I do want to just end by saying I really, uh, beyond what we just did, I think this board uh, should consider what further actions we want to take. And uh, I don't know when the next meeting is coming up. Um, but it's probably in a couple of weeks. So that's in Thursday in August. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Okay, all right. So let's. But do you want so so Brian? Do you want us to make sure that we put this as a, um, a agenda item? Yes, yeah. please. I okay. I think everybody here is in favor of taking a firm, aggressive stance on addressing this issue. And let's take another crack at what that looks like. Okay. And did you have anything to add or you're, okay, okay. Yeah. Um, with that, is there a motion to adjourn? I motion to adjourn. I don't know why I knew you'd be the first one, Karen. Is there a second? <laughs> Seconded. Okay, all those in favor. Shoes on, that's why. <laughs> Good work, right. everyone. Yes. We are adjourned. Awesome. Thank yeah. Everybody. Thank you, Graham. Yep. Thank you to the committee and Everybody. to the staff. Yep. Bye. Good job. Thank you, everyone. Oh, okay. All right. So, try, try your headphones because I agree. I think it's your fan. Well, they said they couldn't hear me when I had my headphone, my headphones in. See, and I thought your headphones were better, but that was just me. So, so should we switch? They said they couldn't hear me at all with my. So what happens is like you talk for like four. Here, do you want to come sit at my desk and I'll talk? I, I want to hear what it. Yeah. I want to hear what it sounds like. So let's switch. So I could, how can I hear that? Is, okay. Do you have your earphone in? No. You can plug them, you can plug them in if you want. They're no, right no, there no, on the table. No, okay. So I'm just talking into your computer normal without headphones. Can you hear the difference? Like you just start talking and then all of a sudden it just disappears. And I think maybe if you go like this, but who wants to look at somebody's forehead? <laughs> <laughs> I, but I can hear you. So, so you're not cut. So I'm not cutting in and out or doing anything funky. Uh -uh. Seriously? Right. That is really weird. Let me like A B C D F G. Here, well, I'll read. I can hear your voice. I'm gonna close the door. Oh yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> you're, you just have too good a hearing. <laughs> and I think that's probably why I can hear you too. Okay. Okay, so I'll just sit like you would, like kind of back at your desk and kind of answer and I'll just read. So dear Longmont City Council, we're living in a moment where community-minded people are urging their city leaders to redirect portions of these budgets to groups specializing in addressing more comprehensive needs. How was that? 
So I didn't hear like the last word. That's what happens. All of a sudden you talk fine and then it just disappears. I don't so understand. What happens when you put the head, the earbuds in? Sorry, maybe you don't want to share those. <laughs> we're probably violating a, some COVID thing. Oh, I'm sure we're totally violating yeah. it, but that's okay. <laughs> so does that help any better or is it still weird? I'll read the next. Therefore, we are tasked with reimagining uh, what it looks like to get Longmont's community members to the right responder at the right time by increasing access to the ready and willing nonprofits that are equipped and educated to meet those needs. I can hear. And is it, is it like solid, solid for you? Mostly, yeah. And I think it's, honestly, I think it's going to depend on the person's computer on the other end, like how well their mic is. So I think that's why like Madeline was struggling because she was on a phone. Yeah. And Brian, knowing Brian, he probably has a super fancy like, you know what I mean? Like just yeah. a more up-to-date thing so it wasn't a struggle. But that still isn't right because your old computer, you could but hear. You can hear my, my laptop just humming. It just is. Oh, I can hear it. Hum. Yeah. Yeah, it's just going. I don't think that's right. And your old computer, you could hear you crystal clear all the time. Right. Um, so I would right. almost ask Jeff. Yeah. 